Hello and welcome to the channel. My name's Saga and I'm here with my father, aka Vastupal Shah. And um, today we're going to basically be trying to discuss like what it was like being a software engineer or becoming a software engineer back in the day. So I'm a Gen Z and my dad's a boomer and we're going to find out what the differences are between being a Gen Z or a boomer software engineer. So dad, welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Vastapal. I'm Saga's dad. Uh, well, I was born in Kenya. I uh, came here in 72, 50 years ago. Uh, I've been kind of, you know, studying, kind of doing my A-levels, O-levels, A-levels, uh, uni degree, and um, kind of, you know, started working software engineering. So clearly by looking at your grey hair, <laughs> you have been uh, a software engineer for quite some time. And so what has your career looked like since you graduated university? Because you did computer science at university, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so basically kind of, you know, I've been a software engineer for the past uh, 30, 35 years. Uh, seems a long time for most people who are probably watching this YouTube channel. Um, so I started kind of back in 86, uh, doing kind of firmware uh, uh, software development for a uh, machine, no, sorry, for a uh, uh, telephone manufacturer, uh, Philips Electronics, uh, writing firmware for a telephony system. Uh, like PABX systems, which you actually use in offices. Uh, then I moved on to kind of uh, doing things for uh, machine tools, which is totally a different kind of sector of uh, industry. Uh, machine tools are for cutting metals, uh, milling, uh, um, turning, those kind of things for numerical controllers. That's what I work for. Again, writing firmware for that. Uh, then I moved on to kind of writing software uh, for a um, ticketing system, a point of sale system, uh, uh, which is kind of where I've been now kind of working for past uh, 23 years, something like that. So it's been a quite uh, enjoyable working life so far. Uh, things have changed from what I have been used to, to what it's now, uh, where, you know, for writing firmware is kind of writing in assembler language and then kind of burning those the actual applications into an EEPROM and putting it onto the motherboard of a numerical controller. So now what I'm doing is actually writing software for uh, web-based solutions um, in uh, kind of a C sharp uh, and kind of, you know, using more technology, which is kind of, you don't write much, much of software yourself or some of the stuff is already written for you. So using packages, kind of plugging those in into your application. Cool. Seems like you've had a, a diverse career. So super interesting, especially since you went from hard tech programming to fully like software solutions. So definitely shows you the variety of things you can get into if you do become a software engineer. So I right now as a filming, am 23 years old and my dad is 50, 60. 60. Yeah, 60. 60. Um, my God, I forgot how old he was. <laughs> But uh, so as you can see, there is a quite a, a big age gap between us. And since I just started my software engineering sort of journey, but my, my dad has been a software engineer for a while, I want to sort of try and understand what the market and industry was like back in the day. So right now, uh, many of you are probably aware that the hot coding languages to know are things like JavaScript, Python, and Java. But what was it actually like when you first did started your career? Right, the most uh, kind of languages for kind of business orientated languages were COBOL. Uh, Assembler was for firmware, which I think I'm joined most of it kind of using, uh, working in certain sectors of the market. Uh, C was coming up along uh, in those days. Uh, Pascal. Sorry, can I help? Pascal, some version. Which, you know, when I kind of did uni, that's why we did Pascal and COBOL was some major languages we learned. And kind of assembler was also taught in those days as well. Mm -hmm. So in the current sort of market of software engineering, it's quite common to hear about many people job hopping between careers to increase their salary and also gain a wider range of experiences. But was this the case when you started work? Um, it was and it wasn't. Uh, because of the kind of languages they were around, kind of, you know, a minimal kind of range of languages to learn. And kind of when we started, kind of, you know, uh, you stick to the kind of... Uh, um, organization for a longer time than what people do nowadays mm. uh, because now you can uh, there's so many varieties of uh, 
firmware, not firmware, but uh, uh, like a use of uh, kind of, you know, uh, modules you, you use, um, which kind of, you know, you have to learn these things because not everybody uses ev all these uh, modules, yeah. yeah? Mm. So to gain a kind of good variety of modules to learn, uh, you have to job hop kind of now frequently than what you used to do in the past. Mm. So would you say nowadays, like the main thing is to job hop compared to stay at one company? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm. Kind of, you know, you probably spend kind of a couple of years at a, a organization and yeah. then kind of move, either move uh, jobs or move projects within the company. Uh, so, you know, you, you learn different aspects of uh, kind of web development or, I mean, most of it is now web development mm. anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Makes I would sense. say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so many of you might be aware that you can get places in companies like Google and Facebook without actually having a software engineering degree or in fact any degree at all. But um, it's interesting to know what was this actually the case uh, when my dad started his career? Was was a degree mandatory or was it not? What sort of was, what was it like? Yeah, uh, so kind of, you know, what you probably learn now in kind of uh, even primary schools and high school kind of, you know, that's what we were taught in a degree level, wow. right? So not many kind of people knew computing side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a demand for, to actually go to university and learn these things. Uh, I mean, myself, I did A level at that time, which was quite a revolutionary, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. not many kind of organizations actually taught computer science as an A level even. Yeah, I, so, in yeah. fact, like even some colleges nowadays or sixth forms, they don't teach A level computer science even nowadays. So some of the people I've interacted with at work, they've said, yeah, we never had a choice of studying computer science A-level. So yeah, definitely yeah. Re revolutionary yeah. since when you were in school. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, you had to go to university to get a uh, kind of job into the uh, computing industry anyway at that time. Mm. And nowadays kind of people uh, can get jobs even when you finish your GCSEs and go into kind of an industry straight away or even kind of after A-levels, which is kind of awesome. Uh, many people choose to have, be a, a apprentice uh, jobs mm -hmm. into a computing industry. Yeah. Uh, but also kind of now as you yourself kind of did a degree, okay, you can do a degree in different kind of um, uh, subject and still get the job into a computing industry. Yeah. And you know what the funny thing is, so, so for my university, I had to pay to go to university. Some people had got money from the government to go to university, so they got paid to go. So how much did yeah. you get paid from the government to go to university? Well, it was a grant, basically. Uh, I think it was the government, our local council used to actually fund you. Mm. Uh, uh, I think it was £1,000 in those days. £1,000? I should say about £1,000. It's too much, £1,000! But then £1,000 in those days were worth quite a lot of money. Still pretty good. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so you had money uh, for your accommodation, food and all that stuff uh, paid by the council uh, to go into and study. So as I said before, like the software engineering market has dramatically changed since 19 whatever you start, 86. 86 to today. So what was what was some piece of advice, maybe a lecturer or a teacher or even like someone at work when you first started, what did they tell you? Which, when you think back at it, like, no, this is not true or correct, or this is not how you should do things in the present day. Well, I wouldn't say most of the relevant things kind of are still apply. Uh, the biggest issue, the uh, biggest uh, things we used to do was actually kind of, uh, when you write code, um, you've got to document it, you know, line by line, what the you know, things were happening during, uh, uh, during the program, kind of. But nowadays, Code is self-documenting more or less. It's more kind of higher level than what we used to do. Mm. And so, it, you know, it's self-explanatory. Uh, okay, there is bits of kind of code you have to actually kind of, you know, uh, write about what the, the actual function is doing. But in the old days, kind of, you have to, I mean, especially assembler languages, yeah. you know, it, it's very tricky to pick up what the code is doing mm. uh, by just looking at it. And in those days, kind of, you had to line, uh, write on each line what the code was doing in English mm. because the code wasn't English. But now yeah. when you read code, it's more English than mm. what it ever has been. Yeah. Uh, and so kind of, yeah, those are the kind of fundamental things which uh, have changed over kind of, you know, uh, the code is kind of more readable mm. uh, by anybody. Yeah, that's quite true. And I, I even would say, um, like nowadays, you don't even see many comments being written in the code. 
So never mind writing a whole separate document to document what the code is about. Most people don't even write comments because the code is, is legible as it is for, for humans when you're trying to interpret what it's doing. So may, many of you know, probably Google came about around 1998 or 1997, which is basically around when I was born. But my dad was already working by that time. So how did you solve problems pre-Google? Uh, with difficulty, yeah. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> You know, we had no Google, so we couldn't search uh, anything. So we had to kind of read books, uh, their application books, kind of, you know, or uh, uh, algorithm books. You know, you had to actually read which algorithm to use. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, do research kind of, you know, through books. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we could find out uh, or to talk to your peers, you know, yeah. how they would solve it. So it was a big discussion kind of between uh, developers kind of, you know, to find out, you know, what is the best way of doing things. Uh, but now you can Google things and kind of, you know, get you the answer more or less instantly. Yeah. You know, uh, where there in those days, kind of, you take your day yeah. to figure out what it, you know, what features of what uh, algorithm to use. Where now you just Google it within two minutes, you, you're there. There we go. Yeah. So, I guess, yeah, the internet has revolutionized the world yeah, of software. Yeah, so. definitely. I mean, it's quick. Uh, it's actually quickened the uh, development of software. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's the good thing about mm -hmm. you know the internet. Yeah, and I guess the the prevalence of open source software nowadays because of the internet was something that probably wasn't the case back in the day. Yeah. Did you have much open no, software? No, yeah. you didn't have any open software. You had to write your own. You yeah, know, that's it. Kind of you know you either write or you you know you buy in kind of you know the software you want to use. Yeah. But I guess like nowadays, you have a new JavaScript framework popping up every month now and then. So like it's completely different field. And I guess because there's such a, a growth in the number of software engineers as well nowadays, because of the, the ease of learning it as well. As we said, you know, university was crucial back in the day. But, but nowadays, you can quite easily pick up how to become a software engineer, learn the skills just even over the Internet, which yeah. is not a possibility back then. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, definitely it's a whole different environment now being a software engineer. So um, the last thing I really want to ask you is in your however many years of you being software engineering, which was what was it? How long? 30, 35 years. 35 yeah. years, which is even older than me, which is insane. <laughs> uh, what has been the biggest change to the industry or the market in general compared to when you first started your career? Well, obviously, the biggest change is going to be the internet. Um, mm. That has helped hell of a lot of things around, um, even kind of, you know, teaching sc children, schooling uh, kind of thing during the pandemic, kind of, you know, they were able to work from home, uh, even kind of doing software development, you can do it from home, mm. you know, you can talk to your peers, you know, through your te teams or Google, uh, Zoom calls and things like that. There's a lot of change, you know, mobile phones again, kind of, you know, a lot of software on that, kind of, you know, that's change. Uh, talking to people, you know, other side of the world. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of change in that kind of context, kind of, you know, uh, but sometimes kind of these things kind of change are good, good if you use it properly. It's bad if you don't use it properly, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, you know, Facebook and things like that, kind of, you can get messages quickly to you. Uh, some of them could be cruel to you, people, which, you know, is the wrong way of using the technology. Um, so, yeah, the, I think Internet is the biggest change, which in my lifetime, uh, even though it's very small lifetime mm. so far, <laughs> um, it that's the biggest change I can see that has happened, which has helped a lot of people. Okay, so there we have it. We have our little discussion with our boomer software engineer <laughs> and Gen Z software engineer. But uh, Dad, do you have any advice for the viewers on my channel if they do want to go into the software engineering industry now? Any Anything that you think will help them along their way? Yeah, most of the things uh, I think what I would say is kind of if you want to go into kind of software uh, side of it, uh, start early, learn bits of it from internet or kind of your peers or whatever. Uh, but yeah, keep learning as much as you can and kind of keep up to date with the new technologies coming out. And that will help you kind of, you know, integrate into any kind of jobs you, in the future you want to kind of move into. Uh, because the spectrum is so wide, you know, the industry who uses software mm. is touched by everything, you know, you know, every industry, you know, software is touched by that. Yeah. You know, whether it's kind of healthcare, to whether it's kind of deep sea mining or you know or flying in into the uh, onto the moon you know 
these kind of things kind of you know everybody will need software yeah and so kind of you know software jobs will be there in the future and more often than what they are now great well yeah. thanks thanks for the advice and thanks yeah. for taking the time to no share your your history with the yeah. viewers as well yeah you know so i uh, hope you guys learned a lot from my dad about his time being a software engineer and well his still time being a software engineer is not quite written off yet nope. but uh, <laughs> still going strong and uh Make sure you uh, like, subscribe, and comment down below what you thought of the differences between being a software engineer now and back in the day. And yeah, I'll see you in another video. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.